Spider-Man, Spider-Man does whatever a spider can. For those of you that don't know, don't know how you wouldn't know if you're subscribed to this channel, I am a massive fan of Spider-Man. Before going to see this film, uh, I was in LA when I saw this, which was nice because I was with my friends Tim H and Dom Ferrer. When we became friends, Tim lived in Belgium, I lived in Nottingham, and Dom Ferrer lived in New Jersey in America. So we were all very, very far away from each other. And the thing that we bonded over was Spider-Man. And this was the first time we were all sat together in the same room to watch a Spider-Man film for the first time together which was, it was, I'll be honest, very, very special for me. It was very, very nice uh, to be able to do that with them. The first time I watched Spider-Man Homecoming, I watched it with such eagle eyes. I was like wide-eyed and watching every frame and every cut and every action just to try and absorb as much of it as I possibly could, which is not the way you're supposed to watch a film. I think I was so excited about it that I didn't really watch it as a film. I just sort of absorbed it all. So I watched it again less than 24 hours later and I was a bit more relaxed uh, and I'm glad I did because I think it's really good. And usually when I see Spider-Man films, I'm a little bit blind at first, and then over time, you know, the veil comes off and I can see, oh, they, they, they fucked it up. It happened with Spider-Man 3, it happened with The Amazing Spider-Man, and it did happen with The Amazing Spider-Man 2. In fact, recently I watched some clips from The Amazing Spider-Man 2, and boy, oh boy, <laughs> it's bad. Again, like I mentioned in my Wonder Woman review, I'm gonna be talking about spoilers in this because it's been out long enough that uh, I think you should have seen it. And if you're waiting for a recommendation from me of whether or not you should see it, yes, you should, it's good. The things I didn't like, this is really weird to talk about because it's actually not the film's fault, it's just Sony's marketing's fault. The trailers spoiled an awful lot of stuff. I was a little bit apprehensive when people were saying things like, oh, this has spoiled the whole movie, it's just showing me the whole movie. I was like, I don't think it has. I think what it's done is it's shown you all the action and gone, look, it's big and it's fun and Iron Man's in it. Come and see the movie, please. And really the film was gonna be like this teenage comedy drama film. I was kind of right, but at the same time, it did ruin story beats for me. For example, all of the uh, ferry scene is spoiled to the point where like, you know that there's, there's no tension watching that scene. You know Iron Man's gonna come save the day. You knew that that was gonna happen. And not only that, but in the film, they use the fact that you as an audience member sort of know that, can they afford Tony Stark to be in this all the way through? So at one point when Iron Man's like floating there and it's just the Iron Man suit, I was like, I was almost a little bit annoyed because I was like, that's just him doing a voice. He's not really there. Like that's almost a bit cheap. But then they use that as a story beat. They use that to where Spider-Man, where uh, Peter Parker says to him after the ferry scene, if you cared so much, you would be here. And then the, the thing opens and there he is and he steps out and it's supposed to be like, oh shit, he really is there now. But we already knew that because it was very, very, very featured in the trailer. That would have been, I think, very affecting if I didn't know that. In a way, it's my fault because I shouldn't have watched those trailers, but I'm a little bit of an addict when it comes to it. I just, I'll, I'll watch as much as I possibly can. But I think for the next one, I say this now so you can all help. <laughs> I'm gonna try and not watch the trailers. So when the trailer comes out, tweet me, don't watch it. <laughs> Another criticism, I guess, I guess I don't I don't really like Marissa Tomei's Aunt May. Some people have pointed out that there's a bit of sexual chemistry between them, which I do kind of see, which annoys me, obviously, because it's his aunt. It's not that she's young, I don't have a problem with that. It makes sense that she's younger, but I just don't really feel the warmth and connection to Peter Parker that I have with the previous ones. I don't know. We'll see what they do with it, but I, right now I wasn't the biggest fan of that. The casting of Tom Holland is amazing. Um, I, I thought that Andrew Garfield did a better job than Tobey Maguire, but really I think what happens is that they all do pretty well within the context of the films that they're in. It depends what they're trying to do with them. Right now, they're trying to make teen movies. A lot of people uh, said that this movie had a John Hughes feel, and they weren't lying to the point where they do reference a John Hughes movie and as soon as they started doing it I was like holy shit this is this is a Ferris Bueller moment and then they sort of went a bit too far and they showed Ferris Bueller and he went ah great movie and I was like did you need to do that because the people who didn't get it would have just thought it was a fun sequence and the people who do get it would have been like ah I see what you're doing and by showing us it just went a bit too far for my liking Michael Keaton as the vulture he's getting a lot of praise right now and he fucking should as well because the vulture isn't a very good character. From the, the version I can remember, I think it might be in one of the cartoons, he is an old man and he's like using the suit to like make himself feel youthful again or something. And th there's many other versions of it as well where like he's just a crook. And in this, you get it straight away that like they deal with the villain's origin 
in the first three or four minutes and you understand where we are from the get-go. And the reveal that he is Liz Allen's, well, that he's Liz Toombs' father was great. Both times that I've seen it in the cinema, it's gained an amazing reaction from the crowd. It's one of those like twists that does happen in these, like if you took away the Spider-Man element and this was just a sort of teen movie or rom rom com coming of age type film, it happens quite a lot in those sort of films. In Crazy Stupid Love, Spoilers for Crazy Stupid Love if you haven't seen it, but watch Crazy Stupid Love. It's revealed that Steve Carell is the father of Emma Stone, who Ryan Gosling is seeing, and that's like a holy shit moment. And it happens, it just happens quite a lot in those types of films. And it's nice that they've taken that type of trope and repurposed it for a superhero film. I thought it was great. The scene in the car following it was amazing. Probably the best scene in the whole film. And I, I, even though it is a bit cheesy, I do love the moment when he's got the red the vulture has got the red light from the traffic lights on his face. And then just the moment when he's definitely got it, it goes green. I thought that was a really nice use of, of natural lighting. I thought it was really good. But my problem, and maybe this is a criticism for the film in general again, but it doesn't let moments breathe enough. Sometimes in dramatic moments, you don't feel the weight of them enough before the hero overcomes them. So in that moment where the reveal happens that Michael Keaton is uh, his girlfriend's Dad, I wanted that to breathe a bit more. And the moment when all the rubble fell on him, number one, I didn't need Tony Stark's voiceover in that moment, but I get it. Like when he's under there, I want to really feel the emotion of like, this is a metaphor for the world being too heavy for him. Or he's trying to take on too much stuff. Cause that is what it's doing. And, and just in that moment as well, when he like, he is a little boy, when he, when he is screaming for help, it's a great moment, but just let it, breathe a little bit more. Um, it's almost like they were worried that people were gonna be bored, but you know, that's a minor criticism. Let's get back into the positives of it. Love the fact that it didn't take place in Manhattan. I like the fact that we didn't see Spider-Man swinging around those buildings at all. We've seen it in every single Spider-Man movie before this. And now it makes me think that when they do finally have Spider-Man ready enough to be able to handle that, it's gonna be an emotional moment, uh, hopefully anyway, that when we see him swinging past the Empire State Building and all that sort of stuff for the first time and people of New York see him and go, whoa, that hopefully will tug on the heartstrings. Also, here's a prediction as well. I talked about this on my friend Tim Kish's podcast, Reasonable Beef, but I'll mention it here as well. The whole storyline of Spider-Man Homecoming is based around a moving day. They're moving from Avengers Tower upstate. That's what the, which is a really weird storyline to have anyway, but it works. But that got me and my friends thinking, oh, who have, they, they've sold that tower. Who have they sold it to? Oscorp? <gasps> if it is, that's a very, very cool thing. And that's, that's another thing that this like, movie does really, really well. It sets up stuff really elegantly. It doesn't ever feel clunky. They're going, okay, cool, they're mentioning that because they want to do it in a sequel, which really annoys me when they do stuff like that. But in this movie, you just sort of have characters that you just sort of meet along the way. The, the world feels like it has texture. You meet Matt Gargan, who is the scorpion. He has the scorpion tattoo on his neck. Uh, you see the shocker and you meet the prowler. You meet Donald Glover's character who says he has a nephew who he wants to protect, which is definitely Miles Morales which means that Mars Morales at the moment in the MCU is probably about 10 years old. They've set that up perfectly so that in three or four films time, they can just introduce him because we've, we've already mentioned that he was here. Like he's definitely in that universe, which is really smart. But they can also, if they don't want to do it eventually, just say it was a wink to the fans. Again, same as Wonder Woman. I thought the score was really good. I thought that Michael Giacchino did a really, really good job of um, the Spider-Man theme. Uh, that's really, really nice. Uh, to, to hear it, like the old 60s version done as an orchestra was like a dream come true. Like uh, me and Dom and Tim have wanted that for years and I'm sure lots of other people have as well. But his new theme I really like as well. I like that it can be used for Peter Parker quite sort of lightly and then it can be used in a grand scale for when Spider-Man's doing something that's worthy of that. And the Vulture's theme I thought was really good. My friend Dom Ferrer, all credit to him for this, but he pointed out that his theme is an answer to the Avengers theme. I won't hum them for you now. You can just research that if you want to. Uh, but yeah, his his theme is like in a minor key compared to the Avengers more heroic theme. It's very, very cool. It's very, very cool. It's little things as well that I really like that make it feel different. Like Peter Parker changing into Spider-Man in real time in the alleyway and then webbing his backpack to the wall. That's cool because before it, they just sort of 
didn't deal with the fact that he left his old clothes in places. I, I liked the fact that they dealt with that problem. It reminds me of in The Dark Knight when he wants a new suit because he wants to turn his head because that had been a problem in all the previous films that Batman would turn like this. So they made that part of the plot. Cool. Overall, I think this is the best Spider-Man film uh, ever made. I still think that Spider-Man 2 is the best film featuring Spider-Man. Uh, but I think that this is the first one where they've really got the character right. And it's nice to see people surprised, meaning like, oh, it's so refreshing. Whereas to me, and I'm assuming a lot of other fans, it's like obvious. It's like, that. yes, that's what we've been trying to get the entire time. So when Andrew Garfield did it, and it felt a bit more like he was cheekier and, and all that sort of stuff, it felt like he was almost there. So we were seeing them almost touch what Spider-Man was, whereas now they've got they firmly landed on it. Um, so if you haven't seen it, you shouldn't have watched this, <laughs> but go and see it. Uh, I can't wait to see it for a third time. So yeah, those are my thoughts on Spider-Man Homecoming. I hope you enjoyed this and uh, let me know your thoughts in the comments below and give it a like. And, you know, if you want to send me uh, a, a love letter, uh, my address 